What is good to be back with you and uh, hoping God's work with you today. And uh, I want to take you back to the 80s and 90s when I grew up as a kid. Uh, it seemed to be a different era of time, back in time before kids had their own iPads and screens everywhere. When, when I was a kid in the 80s and the 90s, we had to invent games outside. Like our parents would just kick us outside, don't come back till dinner. It was different, I know. Um, and you just had to make up a game with whatever you had. For example, one of the, a game that my friends and I played often was called King of the Hill. So what was that like? Well, here's how intricate and layered and how clever this game was. We'd find a big pile of dirt somewhere, and then we race to the top of it, and whoever could stay on top of the hill long, longest was the king of the hill. That was the kind of games we would play, right? We would just push kids off, send them flying down off, and like, I'm king of the hill. And Josh, what was the point of that game? Stay on top of the hill, okay? That's how it was. Those, those were different times. As we get to Psalm chapter 3 this morning, you're in the middle kind of of an epic action film, as it were. David is the rightful king of Israel, but there's a major conflict happening. One of his own sons, Absalom, has staged a coup. I was going to go and pat myself on the back for using the word coup correctly. <laughs> Don't ask me to spell it. His son, Absalom, wants to be king. He's wanting to be king of the hill. And he's coming for his father's throne with violence. And he has all his guys, all his boys with him. You can read more about it in 2 Samuel, but in chapter 15, verse 14, David says this to his servants. He says, arise, let's flee, for otherwise none of us will escape Absalom. Go quickly, or he will hurry and overtake us and bring disaster upon us and strike the city with the edge of the sword. I mean, you can see this in your mind, right? There's a king and his servants, and they're rushing to get out of the palace <laughs> because his own son is coming for blood. He's coming for the crown. So as you read Psalm chapter 3, which is our focus this morning, this isn't David sitting by a quiet stream just composing these lines. He's on the run for his life. This is, the stakes are real, and they're personal. As he's running, he's writing Psalm chapter 3, and that's what we're looking at today. Now, I would venture to say that probably most of us in this room, you're not being hunted by your very own family. Uh, maybe, I don't know what's going on, but, but I bet we can at least say that you're facing some difficulties today. It may feel in some ways like you're running for your life. There was a poet named Annie Johnston Flint. She wrote these words. I wonder if you can relate to them now. She said this, Pressed out of measure and pressed to all length. Pressed so intensely it seems beyond strength. Pressed in the body. Pressed in the soul. Pressed in the mind till the dark surges roll. Pressure by foes. Pressure by friends. Pressure on pressure till life nearly ends. I think David can relate to that. Can you? Have you been there? I've titled the message today, How to Pray While Running for Your Life. Because that's what the text gives us here today. David's on the run. His own son is coming after him. It's one of the darkest and most desperate times of his life. But he's still praying. What can we learn from Psalm chapter 3 today? about how to pray when you're running for your life. I think three things the text is going to show us today. Number one, you discredit the allegations. Number two, you delight in the answer. And number three, you dwell on the assurance. Additionally, I'll give you a content recommendation here as well. It's a psalm called Psalm 118, verse 3 and 4. You can get it on the versusproject.com or their app. If you're not familiar, the Versus Project is a free resource where uh, many different worship leaders write scripture into songs. They don't change the lyrics at all. It's directly from scripture into song. They usually have a free devotional and artwork you can get. 
So I would highly recommend it as a resource, but uh, that Psalm, Psalm 118, verse 3 and 4, I, I feel, feel fits thematically with where we are today. So I would encourage you that with a free resource there. All right, let's get to our first idea here. First, you discredit the allegations. Discredit the allegations. Look back with me at the start. Go back to verse 1. How does David begin? He says this, Lord, how my enemies have increased. Many are rising up against me. Many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. But you, Lord, are a shield around me. Stop right there. Right, so we see everything is not okay in David's world. As he looks out, the news isn't good. Enemies increasing. Many rising up against him. Many are talking about him. But notice... They're not just talking about David. They're making an allegation. They're getting very specific. What's the allegation? He says, many are saying of my soul, there is no salvation for him in God. They say God can't or won't save David. That's a pretty serious allegation. And I think... We would say that allegation being made by his enemies are totally false, but there's a similar feeling, I think, in our culture, in our world today. If you say you trust in God, and some people will mock that, they will disparage that, they'll doubt that, they'll say it's useless, they'll laugh at that. You trust in God? Are you kidding me? So how can we discredit this? How can we discredit when this allegation comes to us? How do we respond when people think it's foolish for us to trust in God? Well, the first thing I would say is flip that question around. Okay, if it's foolish to hope in God, then what or who, what, what's your answer? What or who do you place your hope in? What does the world tell you? The world will offer you solutions, money, relationships, Success, ambition, accomplishment. That's where your hope goes. It's foolish for me to trust in God, but that's what you're hoping in. When you're running for your life, that's going to save you. I want you to watch how this works. I'll give you one example here. We could spend all day on this. A lady named Rhonda Rousey. She was a professional fighter in, uh, in women's combat sports. Uh, she was dominant. She was on the top of the world in the summer of 2015. She had all the things that the world would say is important. She had money. She had fame. She had success. She had titles. She had importance. She won her very first 12 MMA fights. One of her, only one of those 12 fights made it past the first round. She once took out an opponent in 16 seconds. Rolling Stone labeled her the world's most dangerous woman. Sports Illustrated called her, look at the wording here, the world's most dominant athlete. Not just most dominant female, but the most dominant athlete. She had it all. The fame, the glory, the money, all the stuff. Well, then in November of 2015, as she was defending her belt for the seventh time, her day of reckoning came. She was demolished. Her opponent, Holly Holm, took her apart in every way and finished her off with a vicious head kick. Boom. In a moment, Rhonda was no longer king of the hill. And what happens now? What happens in that moment when you fall off? Where's your hope then? Well, I want to show you her quote she said about that time. She said, quote, I was down in the corner and I was like, what am I anymore if I'm not this? I was literally sitting there and thinking about killing myself in that exact moment. I'm like, I'm nothing. What do I do anymore? No one gives a care about me anymore without this. Now, wait a second. Hold up. You're telling me it's foolish to trust in God. But where is the gods of this culture when they need it? If it's foolish to hope in God, then surely somebody like Rhonda would have a firm foundation when her world is shaken. Because she had all this stuff. No, she saw how empty it is. 
She said, quote, no one cares about me anymore without this. The things she thought would be her help, her salvation, those ended up just being a trap. And they left her hopeless when she needed it most. People want to say, it's, oh, it's foolish to trust in God. Then what's your answer? What do you have that's really going to be there for you when you're running for your life? Contrast that with a man named Horatio Spafford. Horatio was a successful businessman in Chicago in the late 1800s until the great Chicago fire burned up all of his investments. Then, two years later, his four daughters were killed as they were on a ship going to Europe for a family vacation. He wrote these words after that tragedy. Tragedy, you may recognize them. We sang them just a couple moments ago. He said, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you see the difference between Horatio and Rhonda? Amen. Horatio, like many Christians throughout the centuries, has found his hope in God. And even in the darkest times, he said, God is enough. It's well with my soul. When he was running for his life, Horatio found out he could count on God. There are times, listen, there are times when you need to discredit the allegations and speak and know the truth that Jesus Christ hears your prayer. Psalm 116, verse 1 and 2, beautiful. It says, I love the Lord because he hears my voice and my pleas. Look at this. Because he bends down and listens, I will pray as long as I have breath. That's how you discredit the allegations. Notice I didn't say argue with the allegations. That's crucial. What David shows us is the best way to discredit the allegations, go right to God in prayer. Say it this way. Praying to the living God is how you discredit allegations. That's why, look at verse 3, David does it. He says, but you, Lord, are a shield about me. That's a statement of trust. In the very God that the people were saying it's foolish to trust in it. David is saying, I have lots of enemies. They're coming for blood. They say you won't save me, but God, I trust you. I know you will. Some questions to consider here. Where would I turn if my worst fears came true? And what or who would I be placing my hopes and trust? And be honest with yourself. Secondly, is what I am strongly pursuing capable of sustaining me if I was running for my life. The first thing you do as you pray, as you run for your life, is to discredit the allegations. Next, you delight in the answer. Look again at verse 3. He says, But you, Lord, are a shield around me, my glory, and the one who lifts my head. I was crying out to the Lord with my voice, and he answered me from his holy mountain. I lay down and slept, I awoke, for the Lord sustains me. The enemies of David were doubting God's salvation, but look what happens. God comes through for David. God answers David's prayer. And David, in turn, starts to delight in the God who saves him. There's multiple ways that he delights in God. Let's look at these. First, he delights in God's protection. He says, you're a shield around me. Like if you've ever played any of the Super Mario games, you get that star and the music changes. You can just run through your enemies. That's how David feels. I think they got that from Scripture, right? Because David says in Psalm 84 and 11, look at this. He says, for the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He delights in God's protection. Secondly, he delights in God's honor. Right? He calls him my glory. In other words, he has a reverence for God's authority. He, he knows he's a king on earth, but he recognizes and he delights that he serves the king of kings. He delights in God's honor. Next, he delights in God's encouragement. 
He says, you are the one who lifts my head. Man, this has been a favorite of mine for many years. Because I have a tendency, I know, when, when, when things get rough, when there's a problem, when there's trouble, I have a tendency to look down at the problem, and I need God to lift my head to remind me that he's got it. He's the lifter of my head. Psalm 27, verse 5 and 6 says, He will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. And now my head shall be lifted above my enemies all around me. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. He delights in God's encouragement. Next, he delights in God's power. Right? He says, He answered me from where? His holy hill. His holy mountain. David knows this, right? He knows Absalom may have temporarily claimed to be king of Israel, but God is permanently on the throne. His plans will be accomplished. He answers me from his holy mountain. No one else is up there but him. He sits on the throne, not Absalom. Did you know this is true right now? Doesn't matter who's in the White House, Republican, Democrat, third party. Whoever, Kanye, I don't care, right? <laughs> it doesn't matter. Amen. I mean, it matters in some ways, but I'm telling you right now, God is still reigning on his holy mountain. Amen. We can delight in his power. Next, he delights in his rest. What a beautiful verse. He said, lay down, and I slept. Imagine that. David delights in the sleep and the rest that God gives when his own son is hunting him down, trying to kill him, he can still sleep at night. That's incredible. If you were alive in the 1990s, there was a song called Tub Thumping by a group called Chumba Wamba. And I would just tell you, it was maybe one of the worst songs ever written. The lyrics go something like this. I get knocked down. But I get up again. No, you're never going to keep me down. Right? You probably, yeah, you probably, just, I hear you, you're, you're like, yeah, I can hear that song, right? <laughs> I get knocked down, but I get up again. I ain't never going to. Yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> they wrote that song about their philosophy of life was to, was to literally party and get drunk into a drunken oblivion and then get up the next day and do it. They were actually a really dark group. They believed in moral anarchy, and that's about it. Somehow they dominated the airwaves in the 1990s with that song. Life was just about getting blackout drunk, and then getting back up and going doing it again. Like, that's your life? How about we remix that, Psalm 3, right? I lay down, and I got up again. No, you're never going to keep me down. Because God sustains me like he did for David in Psalm 3. So I can catch some Z's. <laughs> Whatever. Okay, I'm not Psalm 3. <laughs> David is teaching us, Scripture is teaching us, that man, even when you're on the run for your very life, he can trust God, lay down, and get some sleep. Amen. Even when times are hard, when enemies are all around us, we can delight in our God. I would tell you, we must delight in our God. Remember in COVID, there was all the thing about essential workers and who was essential. And I kind of, who cares about that? What I know, it is essential to delight in the Lord. One pastor named J.J.S. Perown, he wrote it this way. I love it. He says, we need not fear a frowning world while we rejoice and a prayer hearing God. We can delight in Him. We can rest in Him. Some questions to consider here. Instead of focusing on the continual growth and danger of his enemies, David makes the decision to delight in the Lord. How can I turn my attention and affection to God no matter what I'm facing? Secondly, David lists out multiple areas of delight in God. How long, is I, how long has it been since I've listed out the same? Count the ways that you delight in God. And finally, get real personal here. Tonight, as I lay down on my bed, I will thank God for and ask Him for, and then I will sleep trusting in Him. 
Thirdly, you dwell on the assurance. <coughs> Look how David closes it out here in verses 6 through 8. He says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people who have set themselves against me all around. Arise, Lord, save me, my God. For you have struck all my enemies on the cheek. You have shattered the teeth of the wicked. Salvation belongs to the Lord. May your blessing be upon your people. Well, guess what? The enemies have now surrounded David. It's gotten worse. <laughs> He says, tens of thousands of people have encircled me. And David doesn't flinch. He's dwelling on the assurance he has in the Lord. The allegations are false. He knows it. He's, he's, he delights in God. And he says, salvation belongs to the Lord. One commentator, Derek Kidner, says it this way. He says, though encirclement now intensifies the threat, he can confidently face the worst. Because David is dwelling on the assurance he is a man of holy courage. Let me bring this idea of holy courage to life for just a moment. If you're familiar with the uh, very first Avengers film, there's a scene that I think illustrates it. If you haven't, don't worry, I'll walk you through it. Loki, the villain, he's arguing with Tony Stark, Iron Man. They're threatening each other. They're trying to intimidate each other. And Loki, the villain, says... I have an army. Kind of like in a British accent that probably sounds a lot different than what I just said. He says, I have an army. And Tony Stark replies, we have a Hulk. In other words, we've got a huge, green, monster, strong guy on our team. We have a Hulk. And that was it. That was enough, right? Tony had courage. Because he knew he had a strong green dude on his team. Guess what? David has holy courage because he knows he's a child of God. Let me show you another example from scripture. You'll see it up here. King Hezekiah, he one day looks out and he sees that the strong, violent enemies of the Assyrians are coming to attack. And they outnumber the Israelites. So King Hez, he gets his people together, and he says this in 2 Chronicles 32, 7. He says, be strong and courageous, for there are more of us than with him. With them is an army of, with them is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. He says, they have, a, a, they have an army, right? They have an arm of flesh, but we have the Lord our God. That's better than the Hulk. Tony Stark got his script from the Bible. That's what that's what's happening there. He sold his best line from the Word of God, right? They have an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. He had holy courage. Guess what? In the times we live in, we need more men and women of holy courage. People of God who will not back down from what the Bible says. People of God who will not apologize for the truth. Holy courage. We can say it this way. When you dwell on the assurance you have in the Lord, you will be a person of holy courage. Some questions to consider here. Am I staying in God's word to find his assurances so that I can be a, whole, a person of holy courage like David or Hezekiah? <clears throat> Secondly, who do I know is struggling or hurting right now? How can I bring assurance and the love of Jesus to them? Finally, do I have a, we have a Hulk type mindset about God? Am I courageously sharing his gospel without fear of man? We've seen today how to pray while running for your life. We've noticed three big ideas in scripture in Psalm 3. Those are that you discredit the allegations, you delight in the answer, and you dwell on the assurance. And as we begin to close, I want to focus you this way. This is how you do it. You put your trust in the Jesus of Psalm 3. We believe all scripture points us to Jesus. It points us to the gospel. Guess what we see here? Three ways that David and Jesus are alike. And three ways that David and Jesus are different. Let me walk you through these. First, like David... Jesus was betrayed by one close to him, one of his own 
disciples. He knows what it's like to be betrayed. Jesus knows that. <laughs> Secondly, like David, Jesus faced scoffers, doubters, and allegations that God won't save. As he hung on the cross in Matthew 27, they said, quote, he has trusted in God. Let God rescue him now if he takes pleasure in him. Jesus knows what it's like to face those allegations. And third, like David, Jesus cried aloud and entrusted himself to God. Luke 23, he says, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Jesus knows what it's like to walk among the enemies all around and to face these things. But now let me show you where they differ. First, where David struggles and fails to recognize with his wayward child, good news, Jesus reconciles to God any sinner who trusts in him. Romans 5.10 says, if while we were enemies, that's us, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Where David received salvation at his lowest moment, praise God, Jesus gave salvation at his lowest moment. He said to the thief on the cross, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And finally, where, Jesus, where David runs for his life, praise God, Jesus willingly gives his life as a sacrifice. If you find yourself running for your life, then I tell you, run to the one who gave his life for you. Amen. Salvation belongs to him. Hope is found in him. Courage is found in him. At the beginning of the message, I read you a piece of a poem by that woman, Annie John Johnson Flint. Well, guess what? There's more to the poem. Let me close in this way. Let's read the whole thing here. She says, pressed out of measure, and pressed to all length, pressed so intensely it seems beyond strength, pressed in the body and pressed in the soul, pressed in the mind till the dark surges roll, pressure by foes, pressure by friends, pressure on pressure till life nearly ends. But then she says this, pressing into knowing no helper but God, pressed into loving the staff and the rod, pressed into liberty where nothing clings, pressed into faith, for impossible things, pressed into tasting the joy of the Lord, pressed into living a Christ life outward. Let me pray for you.